This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. Growing scrutiny, the doomed Ethiopian Airlines flight showed clear similarities to another deadly crash and pressure mounts on Boeing and its stock. Hitting the road, Lyft is one step closer to going public, but rival Uber is close behind. Blood shortage for dogs, and some in the $17 billion vet industry are trying to fill that gap. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, March the 18th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. A new week brings new questions about Boeing's popular plane, the 737 MAX. Black box data shows, quote, clear similarities between the crash of the Ethiopian jet and the Lion Air accident just a few months ago. There are also reports that federal investigators are looking into the development of the aircraft itself, which has been grounded worldwide for almost a week. Shares today fell more than one and a half percent and have lost about $30 billion in market value since the crash on March 10th. Phil LeBeau has the latest developments. The development and certification of Boeing's 737 MAX airplane is now at the heart of questions being asked by the federal government. The Wall Street Journal says the Department of Transportation is scrutinizing how Boeing and the FAA went about making sure the plane was safe to fly before it was certified two years ago. Separately, a federal grand jury is investigating development of the MAX, issuing at least one subpoena. Boeing says it does not respond to or comment on questions concerning legal matters, whether internal, litigation, or governmental inquiries. We do not comment even as to whether such matters exist. Meanwhile, completed 737 MAX jets are stacking up at Boeing's plant in Renton, Washington. The company is not changing its production schedule and is planning to update the software in all 737 MAX jets, perhaps as soon as next week. That update, in theory, would eliminate potential issues with anti-stall technology suspected of causing a 737 MAX crash in Ethiopia. I think they'll fix this one by having two sensors instead of one, and they'll both have to agree. I think that's a critical comparative that could preclude this from happening again. And two, I'm sure they'll put some ultra-pilot interference mode so that if the pilot rejects it, it disconnects, which I understand it does not. The black boxes of the 737 MAX that crashed in Africa convinces some there is a definite link between that accident and the crash of a 737 MAX last October. In fact, Ethiopia's transport minister says there are clear similarities between the two planes that crashed shortly after takeoff. It may be months before there is a definitive cause for the two 737 MAX accidents. In the meantime, Boeing hopes it can move as quickly as possible to convince authorities its most popular plane is ready to return to the skies. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Carter Copeland joins us now to talk more about Boeing, its stock, and what investors might want to do with that. He is defense analyst at Melius Research. Carter, thanks for joining us tonight. Happy to. You know, it occurs to me there are certain costs that Boeing faces, not only the, the cost of lost business while the, the jet is grounded, there's the possibility of canceled orders. We've heard about a few already. And then, of course, possible litigation costs. Have you tried to add it all up and figure out what it would do to Boeing's bottom line? Yeah, we, we estimated that the non-recurring costs that Boeing may incur to, to get through a, let's call it a, a three-month uh, delay, are, are probably on the order of a billion dollars, with half of that being uh, related to customer compensation and the other half split between legal costs uh, and the cost to fix the airplane. And those are all based on, you know, historical examples and, and public lease rates and uh, things we can observe. Now, uh, there's some variability around that. Uh, you know, when it comes to things like legal settlements, they, we could envision those uh, being larger. Uh, but in terms of, you know, if the plane uh, is suspended deliveries for a quarter or so, you know, we would expect the company to build up a significant amount of uh, planes, just as Phil was uh, implying they're currently doing, right. uh, before delivering them later. And that, that would be billions of dollars, but we would chalk most of that up to timing. Does, well, speaking of the timing, it, <clears throat> now we're seeing that there may be an investigation into the development of the 737, and it seems as though every day the timeline on when this all may be over seems to be getting longer and longer. Have you factored some of that into your analysis? Yeah, absolutely, Sue. I think that there's 
Uh, the, the news over the weekend probably extends that timeline considerably. Now, Boeing has been talking about having a software fix, uh, and that's been in the work for some number of months, and they said it was delayed, in fact, by the government shutdown. Uh, but even though that software fix will be ready to go, uh, they sort of hint in, in the next couple of weeks, I think there's an immense amount of pressure on uh, the FAA mm -hmm. uh, here in the States and EASA uh, in Europe uh, to really dot every I and cross every T when it comes to uh, certifying that the plane is, is airworthy, ready to go uh, with these new changes. And so I think you'll be a little bit more stringent. There'll be a lot more scrutiny. Uh, I think that, you know, could push this into, into some number of months. Right. Uh, but I'm not sure it, it points to us having more extensive changes than what Boeing is already sort of proposing. What do you do with the stock, whether you're a shareholder or a non-shareholder who's watching this unfold right now? Yeah, I, I don't. I think we will look back in, in the longer term and say this was a very attractive entry point for a company that uh, is, you know, profitably growing in a, a very attractive market, and that's the market for commercial air travel, which, uh, as you know, has been growing very attractively for the last several years, and, right. and we predict will do so for another dozen or so. Um, you know, so I think this will prove to be a, a, a great entry point, but it will require patience. We are going to continue to see uh, a lot of uh, headlines fly out. Uh, you're going to see customers talking. You're going to see regulators talking. And each one of those things, I, I think, probably makes this stock somewhat range-bound in the short term. But, but longer term, we're still, we're still bullish. All right. Carter Copeland with Melius Research. Again, thanks for joining us tonight. Of course. On Wall Street, stocks rose, and the Dow posted a four-day win streak, despite the decline in Boeing's shares. Investors looked ahead to a busy week, which also includes a Fed meeting. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 65 points to 25,914. The Nasdaq added 25, and the S&P 500 was up 10. Stocks today are not far from reaching their most recent highs, making this market much different from the one of just a few months ago. Mike Santoli has more. This week marks a half year since the stock market last posted a record high. And with the persistent rally since December, the S&P 500 has recovered four-fifths of its 20 percent drop from its September peak. But stocks have staged this rebound with little new enthusiasm over the economy and without investors returning fully to a confident bull market posture. Stocks are now less than 4 percent from that September peak. And it's fair to ask exactly how they've made up so much ground so quickly while corporate profit expectations have slipped. It starts with the fact that the December freefall reflected premature or exaggerated fears of an oncoming U.S. recession, exacerbated by worry over Federal Reserve tightening and year-end tax loss selling. The snapback has taken hold as the Fed sent a message of patience toward further rate hikes, which has held Treasury bond yields near their lows of the past year. Low rates have bolstered stock valuations as dividend payers and big growth companies with sturdy profit margins hold up the indexes. Investors have been a bit skeptical of the rally until recently, with cash continuing to flow out of equity funds until a big belated rush of contributions last week. This could represent the public growing tired of watching from the sidelines as stocks levitate. The question now is just how long stocks can thrive on low rates and the reversal of excessive investor pessimism. The bulls point out the profit forecasts for 2019 are beginning to stabilize and China is trying to jumpstart its economy. Still, it's not yet clear if that combination will be enough to take stocks beyond the shadow of the bear that has stalked the market for half a year. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mike Santoli. Elsewhere, the nation's home builders are feeling good about their business right now. An industry gauge of home builders sentiment released today held steady in March. And most say they anticipate a solid spring home buying season. Affordability, though, has been the biggest issue facing the new home buyers. And many in the industry hope that lower mortgage rates will help fuel sales. But if you're in the market to rent instead, get ready to pay more. Diana Olick tells us where you'll pay the most. Home prices may be cooling off this spring, but rents are heating up yet again. After taking a breather last year, thanks to new supply on the market, rents for both single-family homes and multifamily apartments are now rising at the fastest pace in nearly a year, that according to Zillow. The median monthly rent in February came in at $1,472, an increase of 2.4 percent compared with February of 2018. For the typical renter, this means about $400 more a year. This after rents actually fell last fall for the first time in more than six years. Of course, all real estate is local, with rents now significantly higher than a year ago in Orlando, Phoenix, Riverside, California, 
Tampa and Pittsburgh. Rents are unlikely to rise as fast as they did three years ago when demand was soaring because more millennials are now buying homes and home ownership overall is rising. Mortgage rates are lower again and that could give the spring housing market a much needed boost. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. It is time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Facebook was downgraded to hold from buy at Needham. The analyst cites the growing risk of regulation, executive departures, and CEO Mark Zuckerberg's strategy shift. Mark has said he's going to do a strategic pivot, which he did not talk about on the last earnings call, where he's going to combine Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger. He's going to encrypt them and then have them all disappear. And that feels like a strategic pivot that actually drove the two people, very senior people, out of the firm last week, saying it's going to be a multi-year challenge to reorient the business. The price target is $170. The stocks fell 3% to $160.47. PVH was downgraded to neutral from buy at City. The analyst cites the retailer's dependence on outlets and says that could weigh on sales and profits. The price target is $120. Despite the downgrade, though, the stock rose fractionally to $111.45. And Dollar General was upgraded to overweight from equal weight at Barclays. The analyst says the company's investments will give it a competitive advantage. And the price target is $125. The shares rose more than 2 percent to $116.53. Still ahead, some small businesses are enjoying big savings under the new tax law, but there is a feeling that the law did not go far enough. Goldman Sachs said today it is expanding a program that aims to improve diversity at the bank. The company has set what it calls aspirational goals of having half of its all-new analysts and entry-level associates in the U.S. be women. It's also issuing targets for black and Latino hires for the first time. CEO David Solomon said he thinks the goals can be achieved. J.P. Morgan is outlining a new $350 million program aimed at improving job prospects for people in underserved communities. The bank's five-year plan includes training for in-demand digital and technical roles and money to help employers and the educational system work together. J.P. Morgan's CEO says the program is designed to help bridge our economy that is divided into haves and have-nots. It is absolutely obvious that, you know, a big chunk has been left behind. So 50, 40 percent of Americans make less than $15 an hour. Forty percent of Americans can't afford a $400 bill, whether it's medical or fixing a car or something like that. Fifteen percent of Americans make minimum wages. Okay, 70,000 died from opioids. We've kind of bifurcated the economy. Mr. Diamond said the new world of work is about skills, not necessarily degrees. You'll soon be able to buy shares of Lyft on the open market. The ride-hailing company is preparing to go public, and today it entered the home stretch with the start of its road show, an event that is used to market initial public offerings to Wall Street. Leslie Picker is in New York for us tonight. Lyft is used to the road. That's where the ride-hailing company's business lives. But their road show is something new. It kicked off in earnest today, allowing its executives to pitch their new shares to investors. CEO Logan Green and President John Zimmer traveled in lift cars all across Wall Street, meeting with banks to explain to their sales teams how to market their deal. We're at the very beginning of a generational shift from car ownership to transportation as a service. The deal is a boon for Lyft's executive team as well as the banks underwriting this offering. They're expecting to sell about $2 billion worth of stock at a valuation around $20 billion. Lyft is the first of many large tech IPOs expected to come to market this year. Being first allows Lyft the chance to share its story ahead of larger rival Uber as well as get out while market valuations are high. I think this is the best time to come out. Uh, they're doing a great job. At the major market, the macro market is good, IPO sentiment is good. So I think this is the right time to get out and they're doing the right thing. Lyft's roadshow will take place all over the country over the next two weeks. The feedback they get from investors will help determine a final price to sell their shares, something they plan to set next Thursday. And next Friday, the stock will begin trading under the symbol LYFT. 
For Nightly Business Report, I'm Leslie Picker, New York. Lyft's larger rival, Uber, is also going public. It plans to make its stock market debut in April. But between the two ride-hailing companies, which one might be better for investors? Joining us to talk about that is Kathleen Smith, principal and co-founder of Renaissance Capital. Kathleen, great to see you again. Welcome back. Thank you. And you say it's going to be tricky to make money in either one of these companies. Why? Well, they're both losing money for every $100 uh, ride. Uh, Lyft is losing $6 per ride, and Uber is, uh, sorry, Uber is losing $6, and Lyft is losing $12. So they're both money losing companies. That should be a red alert for investors looking at these businesses. But if we had to pin you down, I mean, Uber's clearly the, the pioneer and the much larger of the two companies. Does that give it an advantage that would be more attractive for investors, or do you go with the, the upstart Lyft? I mean, which way do you go here? If you had to pick one. If I had to pick one, I'd go with the dominant market leader, even though we have to give Lyft some credit for being faster growing and gaining in market share. But Uber is really the giant company, and generally the giant companies tend to be the better call if you were going to make it better uh, protection in a sizable firm. And uh, we're just looking at some of the points that you sent us. You say this should be part of a well-diversified portfolio because there may be some volatility and because of, of the financials, which you just discussed. The way we would approach it is, unless you're able to get shares on an IPO, the best thing, especially for companies like these, which are growth companies and growing at all costs, would be to put them into a portfolio of other companies so that you can at least uh, have some other uh, diversify away your, your risks. There's still risk, so uh, that would be the approach we take. That's why we uh, have put together an IPO ETF that's a basket of 60 or so newly public companies, and you'll moderate your risk that way. Now, uh, Lyft is going to have uh, two different classes of stock. Here we go again. You know, this is happening with other technology giants as well. Uh, and this ideally is to give the founders more control over their company. Does that, should that give investors pause before they decide to buy this stock, do you think? It's not favorable to have a company that has that limits the shareholders' right to vote. That's not favorable. I think it's a negative. I don't think it will stop the deal from happening. But to have the founders who own really less than 5 percent of this company control about 50 percent of the vote, it, it's not right. Uh, if things go wrong, uh, public shareholders have a right to make changes and to have their vote represented mm -hmm. equal to their shares. On that and note. Kathleen yeah. Smith with Renaissance Capital. Kathleen, thank you. Thank you. A big acquisition in the fast-growing payments sector, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Fidelity National Information Services is buying WorldPay for about $35 billion in cash and stock. The deal is one of the biggest in that industry, and it comes amid greater regulatory scrutiny. Today, the CEO of Fidelity National said the pairing makes sense. We've really got two very good companies coming together here. We're going to be able to accelerate our growth as a company, so it's a pivot to growth for us on a combined basis. We'll do $12 billion in revenue and growing 6% organically and producing $5 billion of EBITDA. World Pay shares were up nearly 10% today. Fidelity National was off a fraction. Both stocks closed around $108 a share. There is takeover chatter in the casino industry right now. Reports tonight say that Caesars Entertainment and El Dorado Resorts are in early merger discussions. No guarantees, though. According to Reuters, El Dorado has yet to make an official offer for Caesars. Activist investor Carl Icahn has a stake in Caesars, and he has been pushing for just such a sale. Caesars rose 4.5% in today's trade, while El Dorado fell nearly 2% to 45.60. And credit rating agency S&P has placed Kraft Heinz on review for a possible downgrade that would lower the company's credit rating even closer to junk status. This after the struggling food company failed to file its annual report with the SEC. The stock fell a fraction to 32.03 after hitting a 52-week low during today's trading session. Over the next three years, Marriott plans to open more than 1,700 hotels around the world. The company expects more than 40 percent will be in North America. In the same time frame, Marriott says it could buy back up to $9 billion worth of its stock. The stock rose 2 percent to 124.96. The cannabis producer Tilray reported a wider-than-expected quarterly loss. 
but its revenue surged by more than 200 percent year over year to about $15 million. The company says expenses grew as the company expanded and increased production. The stock rose in initial after-hours trading. It finished the regular session down a fraction to 72.24. This tax season, not only are individuals trying to navigate the new tax laws, but so are small business owners. And for some, it's a bit complicated. Kate Rogers takes us to Main Street tonight. Lana Paul's small business is enjoying big savings under the new tax law, at least for now. The entrepreneur owns four businesses across Iowa and said this year she saw a drop in her overall tax burden thanks to the qualified business deduction. She was also able to expense a major investment, buying six new tractors totaling a million dollars. Her accountant says her savings look substantial. We're estimating around up to $40,000 and by utilizing that, we gave our employees raises knowing that that was going to help us for taxes this year. And Main Street advocates point out corporations still have a 21% rate, while pass-through businesses could face rates of up to 29.6%. While we got some groundwork laid for, for parity for small companies, we didn't actually get there. So corporations, the big corporations that make millions of dollars are actually seeing their tax rates at a, at a lower level than many small businesses that are pass-throughs uh, that, are, that are making less money. And we don't think that's, that's fair. We think we need to get closer to parity than we have. Taxes have long been a trouble spot for small businesses. The National Federation of Independent Business, NFIB, says that at least 10% of small business owners have ranked taxes as their single most important problem nearly every month since 1973, when the group began polling Main Street. Despite the tax law's benefits, small business owners like Paul face another test. The deduction she used to lower her taxes will expire after 2025. So Paul went to Capitol Hill on behalf of the NFIB to urge lawmakers to make these changes permanent. For now, though, Paul is feeling good. She recently expanded one of her businesses with a 40,000 square foot warehouse and says she sees the same optimism from other entrepreneurs in her area. Business in this area really seems to be booming. Um, down the line, I think what I'm hearing and seeing is more people are getting a little concerned because of the provisions not being permanent. So I think there's great optimism for at least the next two, three years here. And then after that, I think people start getting a little more concerned. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers. Some sad news tonight. Well-known economist Alan Kruger died over the weekend. He advised both Presidents Clinton and Obama and served as the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors from 2011 to 2013. His focus was labor economics, where he emphasized data rather than theory. Kruger taught at Princeton University for more than three decades. The family, in a statement, said the cause of death was suicide. He was 58 years old. Arlington, Virginia approved a multi-million dollar incentives package for Amazon to build its second headquarters in Crystal City, Virginia. On Friday, we told you that this vote was to take place over the weekend. Amazon is promising 25,000 jobs in the neighborhood, but some activists wanted to send the company packing, like they did in New York. Pet care clearly is very big business these days. People will do just about anything and spend just about any amount for their furry friends, especially when it comes to their health. And now the veterinary industry is trying to fill a surprising shortage to help pets in need. Jane Wells has our story tonight. This is a dog receiving a blood transfusion, and this is a dog blood bank, a rare thing in the $17 billion U.S. veterinary business. Go, Titi, go. Jackie Linner found out how rare when her beloved lab, China, suddenly needed emergency surgery for a tumor. The doctor had troubling news. There was no blood. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, there's no blood. Linner did her own legwork and managed to find one unit of blood an hour's drive away, costing hundreds of dollars. We were able to use this one unit of blood, and, um, you know, she made it through the night, and she went into cardiac arrest, and she passed away. For all, that we, for all that we do for our pets, most of us don't realize that pets can help each other. 
Dogs and cats each only have two blood types, and they cannot donate to each other. And, of course, human blood doesn't work. Meantime, there are only a handful of pet blood banks around the country, and supply and demand are completely out of whack. Blue Pearl Emergency Pet Hospital started its own mini blood bank in Paramus, New Jersey, buying the equipment and training staff because too often they were coming up short. I could call um, one of our commercial blood banks that we use routinely and order a certain type of dog blood and they could have it to me within four days or they can tell me, well, we'll get it to you in four weeks. Annual screening of a donor can cost $1,200, a service the hospital does for free. And to lure new donors, they have a Facebook page and treats. We offer a month supply of dog food, um, which owners are pretty excited about because that is a costly thing. But some critics argue pets have not given their consent to be donors. I thought they were joking at first because I'm like, a dog can't talk. You can't ask a dog if he wants his teeth cleaned either. If people knew that it could help and save another dog's life, I feel like in the dog world, people really care about other people's dogs too. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jane Wells. And before we go, here's a look at the final numbers on Wall Street. The Dow rose 65, NASDAQ added 25, and the S&P 500 was up 10. And that does it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. See you tomorrow.